No one can work your salvation out. Nobody. And the day you die is between you and God. That's it. Your attorney can't go with you. Mom and dad can't go with you. Your pastor can't go with you. Nobody goes with you when you stand before God. It's just you and him. And he brings out a book. And either your name is written in the eternal book or it's written in the book of remembrance. And the book of remembrance is associated with the judgments. The things that we've done. Because we may stand before him and say, but Lord, why isn't my name in the book of life? It's in the book of remembrance. Why? Here's what you didn't do. Here's what you did. This is what prevented you from getting in the book of life. See, the book of life represents eternal. The book of life is associated with the will of God. The word says, those who do the will of God will enter the kingdom of God. Those who do not do the will of God will not enter the kingdom of God. So it's our responsibility to find out what God's will is. That's our responsibility. You know, many people are going, well, if, if God wanted me to do that, he would do this. No, he doesn't work that way. He sends out the invitation. You either accept it or reject it. When people cry out to God for help, he always puts you in a place to learn. So we're either willing to learn or we're willing to burn. It's that simple. Time is running out. Judgment is here already on the earth. It's been on the earth. The purpose for judgment is to awaken people so they're not caught in the wrath of God. Rather be in judgment than his wrath because nobody escapes his wrath. Amen? So there's something that's going on. The word tells us very importantly about training. Would you turn to Ephesians chapter 4? In verse 11, would you read it with me, please? It says, And he himself gave some to be what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what? For the what? For equipping. Equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the edification or edifying of the body of Christ. It's amazing because when I was a child and I was going to a church, they never educated us. Said a few scriptures, passed the bucket around, made the announcements. Everybody booked. Went back to their old life. No, there was no change. There was no change. The only thing they were looking for was change. So I would leave my dope outside, leave the guns and everything outside the church because I always thought God was in the church. <laughs> and then when I got done with everything, I'd left and go pick it up behind the bushes and go back to my worldly life. Because there was no change. There was no conviction. There was no healing. There was no truth. It was all ritualistic, religious dogma. And I didn't change. I stayed the same. And I ended up going to prison. I didn't even know what a Christian was. That was just another part of a religion. But when the Lord visited me, delivered me, and healed me, I realized it wasn't about a religion. It was about a person who was a king who created me. And I was a part of that kingdom, but never knew it. And all the things in the world were preventing me from knowing who I am. Constantly putting things in front of my path, trying to bring an exchange of his presence into a bottle, into drugs, into a needle, into fame, into fortune, into sex, 
and to everything else to prevent me from knowing him. And when I realized that, my whole desire was fulfilled because every one of us is born with a desire to want to know what is the truth. What's the truth? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is the truth? See, the truth is not just knowledge. The truth is a person. People look at Jesus as the Son of God. I look at him as God because he is. So many people only acknowledge him in a certain level. He's God. God can be anything at any time, anywhere he wants. In fact, he can be in your house, in my house at the same time. Because he's God. And he can come in any form that he wants. He can come to you as a man. But you know he's God. I had a visitation from an angel one time. And to me, I thought he was a person at first. But he knew every one of my thoughts. And there was fire in his eyes. He was a big, dark man. And he began to speak to me. And he gave me a visitation. I was in the park by myself. And I was crying out to God. I decided to go park my car and walk in the park as deep as I could. And I began to cry out to the Lord. I wanted to know more. This was after my visitation. Where are you? And this man drove up in his clunker vehicle, started, call, started calling to me. And he began to know my thoughts instantly. And I realized then that there was a visitation from the Lord. See, he can come to me and you any way he wants. And sometimes he's come to us when we didn't even know it. Because he's God. But there's something very important. He's always trying to put us on the right path. He's always trying to teach us so we don't go back to the old ways. He's always trying to encourage us, and he's always trying to bring us something. He, he's a daddy that loves to bring gifts to his children. And you never know when or how it's going to come. But too many times people miss it because they're not in position. And they miss. They get caught up. They get caught up in busyness. They get caught up in their life. They get caught up in them. And they begin to miss what God is trying to do. See, there should be an expectation every day. Every day when we get up, there should be an expectation of, Lord, where are you going to visit me? How are you going to visit me? What's going to happen? See, there should be a sensitivity in our life every day as children of the Most High God of somehow how he's going to visit me and you every single day. What's he going to show me? How is he going to speak to me? See, so sure, there should be that desire within us so that we're looking for it. There's an expectation. Amen? So, in this, one of the things that God is trying to do is train us up. And in, in verse 12, it says, For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 13, would you read it with me? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a what? Perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be what? Children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. In other words, so that we're not tossed to and fro, so that we just, we're not moved by all kinds of goofiness and all environment. We're not moved by the environment of worldliness that tries to impress us and push us to move us so that we are equipped so that we are unmovable all the days of our life and all the way home. He says, 
verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may what? Grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. How can a part do its share if it's not trained? Can't. They'll just think that they've been born into this world to be a mom, to be a dad, to have children, to have grandchildren, to work, to leave something behind and die. No! That's not God's will. There's more to that. That's a will, will of the world, not the will of my dad. Amen? <laughs> Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes what? Growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So there must be training for reigning. Amen? Without training, we get misled. We get tossed. We don't look at these as Bible studies. These are training sessions. These are areas where God is revealing strategies and tactics. He's exposing the enemies in our life, and he's given us the weapons to overcome. Amen? Praise God. So, in Galatians chapter 5, In verse 16. Uh, no, let's start at 13. Galatians 5.13. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Liberty is freedom. I want you to understand that freedom is learned and trust is earned. Freedom is what? Learned. It's learned. Jesus said, come to me and learn from me. Why? So you can be free. There are people that are in bondage and don't even know they've been in bondage because they've been in bondage their whole life. If you were to put somebody in prison and they never knew anything about the outside, they just thought that was their life. People have been in bondage their whole life, never even knowing what freedom is. They just said, well, this must be life. I guess I was just... Born to be sick all the days of my life. No. Or I was born to be this way. Or I was born. No. I guess this is just a card. The deck of cards. This was my hand that I got dealt from God. No. You are what you have inherited from the, your ancestrals. But you can break that off and get a fresh inheritance from the throne room of God. So that you become brand new with healing, deliverance, and freedom. But these things must be learned. Where there's no training, there is no freedom. I cried out for freedom for a long time. It wasn't until God put me into a house where there was freedom. Where his presence was. Hallelujah. Verse um, 13 again. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, which is freedom. Only do not use this freedom or liberty as an opportunity for the flesh for through love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself but if you bite and devour one another beware lest you be what consumed by one another all right verse 16 are you ready let's speak it i say then what Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you desire or wish. In other words, your flesh has another desire. Because we were born into this world, and we have a desire within me and you, in our flesh, in our members, that wants to still serve the world, live according to the world. It's called the old man. It's called the old you. And that's according to the flesh. The misuse of freedom will take an individual back into bondage. Man, you can be free one day and bound like, bound right to hell the next day. That's all it takes. Your choices. Every choice we make 
there's a reaping. We're going to either reap something good or something bad. Every choice we make, every decision we do, there's always a ripple effect. Every misuse of freedom will take an individual back into bondage. Walking in the Spirit is what keeps us in the area where we are in God's will. It keeps us in that place where we have dominion. It keeps us in that place where we have victory, where we overcome the world. There are what we call the three abides. So walking in the Spirit is essential. Without walking in the Spirit, we can't please God. Because walking in the flesh displeases God, and walking in the Spirit pleases God. So in this, there are what we call, I call the three abides and the three denies. The three abides, it's the word says, abide in prayer and in, in the word of God. Abide in the praise and worship. Abide in the fellowship and the spirit and abide in the fellowship. Those are three abides. I'll tell you here in a second. Prayer and word. Why? These are covenant promises. How, if you don't know this, how are you going to know? See, people are accustomed. The enemy has got people to be accustomed to go to church to hear a message and to leave, but never to take notes. That's not training. Training is note-taking. Why? Because everything you learn, you should be able to teach someone else or you're rejecting God's training. Is everybody okay? Why? Because we want to be trained to reign. Amen? This is a training process. This is not some religious Bible studies. This is not a religious time. Jesus is not about religion. He's about a king, a kingdom, and an eternal place that he created his own people. And he sent them into this world to overcome the enemy that have been taken captive. His people taken captive by them. Three abides. You abide in prayer, in word. That's the first one. You abide in praise, in worship. That's the second one. And you abide in the fellowship of the Spirit of God and the fellowship of corporate. That's the third one. That's the three abides. The three denies. The word says, deny yourself. Pick up the cross and follow. That means Dismantle you, the old you. Constantly keep your old man dismantled. That's called deny self. Pick up the cross means you got to fight. If you were to actually look at the cross, it looks like a sword that's been stuck in the ground. You pull that cross out, it's a sword. Jesus fought to get to that cross, and he fought See, he could have rescued himself. He fought not to be rescued. So that you and I could be rescued. The three denies. Deny yourself means dismantle yourself all the time. Pick up the cross means to fight. Spiritually fight. If you don't know how to do spiritual warfare, then how are you going to fight? Well, you've never been trained up then. Then get trained up. You know, people are going, oh, Lord, rescue my children. He says, why don't you fight for them? Well, I don't know how. Well, go somewhere and learn. And the third one is deny self, pick up the cross, and follow. That means submit to God so you can resist the devil and endure. Submit and endure. Those are the three denies. Three abides and three denies. Sounds Hebrew, doesn't it? <laughs> now these three abides and three denies is going to produce something. Are you ready? Spiritual instruments. Spiritual instruments. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5.
1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 8, Is everybody there? First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Let's read it together. Be what? Be what? Be what? So if you drink, are you sober? If you use drugs, are you sober? Okay. Be sober, be what? Vigilant. See, sober means alert. Be alert. Do you know that one drink will move you out of alertness? One drink. When you and the Lord was restoring my wife and myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. I get to use my wife at the pulp, but I love it. <laughs> but you know, when God was restoring us, and uh, we hadn't been remarried yet, but he was restoring us. So she went out to lunch with her, her sister because, you know, her family, I mean, anyways, we were a mess. And so there wasn't really a good uh, uh, reconciliation and everything was a mess, especially all the things that I did and whatever. And uh, so she went out to have lunch with her sister to tell her that we were getting remarried. And so she came home and I could smell wine on her. I said, did you drink? And she goes, I had one glass of wine with my sister. I said, okay. And I shared, I said, in love now. <laughs> I said, Kate, if you want to be married to me, you can never have a drink again. Never. Never. If you want to be married to me. When well, she got all flustered and ran in her room and cried. Well, a little while later, she came out and made the decision she would never drink again. Of course, we wouldn't be here, would we? <laughs> the Lord told her. God decided for her. She went to the Lord, and the Lord told her, cut it out, sister. Marry this dude. We got a plan. <laughs> So we got remarried, and it's been over 21 years. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Give God glory. But in that, people don't realize that one drink, that's all it takes is one drink. Not only that, booze is a, a cursed item. And people go, oh, Jesus drank with them. Well, Jesus didn't get drunk. And what they call it, in the Old Testament of good wine was fresh grape juice. It wasn't fermented. When it was fermented, he didn't drink it. Why do you think he went in and created new wine? Hello? What did they say? Well, they always give the good wine first. But you saved it for last. Why? Because it wasn't fermented. See, because when they used to make the wine, they would crush the grapes, and there was yeast on the skins of the grape. And after a period of time, it would ferment. And, it'd be, and, and the word tells us it bites like a viper, and you will see things. No kidding. <laughs> you will see things. You will see. Why? Because you just got sucked into their realm, and you're going to see those shadows. Huh? Why do you think you drive by the bars and they say food and spirits? Nobody pays attention to it. Why would you go in a place that tells you there's spirits in there? You know, we, we were brought up that, oh, it's just a place. They mean joyful spirits. No, those are demons in there, man. What does the word say? It says, woe to him who gives strong drink to someone. Bartenders. Woe to him. Woe means without what? Without eternity. Woe to them. Anyways, we are to be sober and what? Vigilant. That means 
alert and consistent. Alert and what? Consistent. Why? Consistency is the key to victory. You're not consistent. It's impossible to have victory. It's impossible. So we're to be alert and sober because your adversary, the devil, it says the devil, so it doesn't say your neighbor or the bartender. It says the devil, demons, powers of darkness, wickedness in heavenly places, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Why? Well, if you're not sober, he's got access to you. If you're not consistent, he's got access to you. Does everybody get it? Amen? Okay. Now, I want to talk about eight spiritual instruments. Instruments are essential. The first instrument that we need is knowledge. We need knowledge. The word says in Hosea 4, 6, you don't have to go there, but you can write it down. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed. Well, how are you going to get knowledge? Well, you're going to get into a fellowship that's what? Training you. Think about, look, when you begin to learn stuff, when people come into our discipleship house and come into this fellowship, and they begin to learn some of the things that, oh, my God, I didn't know that. I've been doing that my whole life. I didn't know that those were accursed items. I thought that was, I thought that was okay. I didn't know. And these were all accesses that the enemy has. You know, the word says he's the most cunning. That means he's subtle. He doesn't come to you every day and say, hi, I'm the devil, and I'm going to do something to you today. <coughs> he never warns you, but I can tell you that the Holy Spirit warns you. And he tells, he guides us to all truth, and he tells us things to come if we're in the Spirit. But if we're not in the Spirit, how are we going to know? We're going to just go about our whole life and do whatever and have our ups and downs tossed and turned and have, have the enemy constantly steal from us and, and bring us into oppression and, and be anxious and fearful and, and run to the doctors for medication, never trusting God. So in this, knowledge is essential. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Amen? And in Galatians 5, I'm going to go back there for a minute. Galatians 5 and verse 19. So knowledge is an instrument. It's the first one we're talking about. Knowledge. Knowledge will help us to discern between what is flesh and what is spirit. Because what is spirit pleases God. What is flesh displeases God. Now look at this. What does it say in verse 19? For now the works of the flesh are evident, which are what? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which is also associated with drugs, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and anything like it which is the works of the flesh, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, who practice, who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They do not have access to eternity. They will be rejected. Is everybody okay? You're getting this. Anyone who practices these things will be rejected from entering eternity. So, if we know this, that gives us knowledge, doesn't it? This knowledge is saying, look it. This is the knowledge that is of truth, and there are knowledge of the world which is lies. See, now the world approves these things. The world approves same-sex marriage. The world approves abortion. The world approves, go ahead, drink till you die. Smoke until you die. This is what the world approves. Go ahead and lie and cheat. 
Just don't get caught. See, they don't put God first. That God sees all, knows all, hears all, thinks all. Everything. Knows everything. How many hears are in your head? Knows every thought. There isn't anything he doesn't know. How many breaths, how many heartbeats, he knows it all. Nothing is hidden from him. But the world makes it like, just go ahead and do it. Nobody will know. No, that's how the world thinks. So knowledge is what's going to separate us, the things of the world and the things of God, the eternal realm. Amen? Is everybody all right? So that's going to separate us of the things of what is the spirit and what is the works of the flesh. What is the works of the spirit and what is the works of the flesh? That's why you've got to know the word. And that's why you must be in a place that is training. The second thing, the second instrument is in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Knowledge is the first. Second Timothy chapter 2. Is everybody there? Verse 21. It says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue what? Righteousness, love, faith, peace, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid what? Foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach. So if you want to be a servant of the Lord, you must be able to teach. Patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their what? Senses. Senses. That is the second instrument is your senses. That they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been captive, taken captive by him to do his will. Your senses. I'm not talking about Earthly senses. Senses we talk about as smell, taste, touch, so forth. These senses that I'm talking about is an inner witness within me and you. It's an inner witness by the Spirit. It is a sense. There is an area where we have a, um, you can go into a place. In fact, you can drive by something and smell a fire, right? You can smell Man, I can smell it. Well, you acknowledge that as a fire. Well, let me tell you, you can smell a demon too. You can smell a spirit. And, and, and this area of smell and taste and touch, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's that area of God's presence that you can also sense. But once you sense it, then the smell may come. But in this sense is that we are looking at right now is called an inner witness. It senses within me and you by the Holy Spirit. Go to um, 1 John chapter 5. Spiritual instruments. I, uh, when I was in the military... I was, used to fly in helicopters, and uh, I used to fly search and rescue. And I wasn't a pilot, but we didn't have enough pilots to go around. So they would take, I was a plane captain, and so they would take one of us and put us in a co-pilot seat and say, come on, I need pilot, I need air time, and let's go flying. And we go flying, we go up and down the beach and so forth, and it was cool. I used to, anyways. And so at... We'd have to do nighttime, night flights. 
And let me tell you, at night, you can't see nothing. You must rely on those instruments. And if you don't rely on every pilot, every plane, and anything that they fly, instruments is everything they rely on. And I always, when I, after I got saved and so forth, I always utilized that as an instrument, as a, something to compare walking in the Spirit, relying on these instruments. In fact, during the day, no matter what, if, if a pilot had to have so many flight hours and they had nighttime hours, if it was during the day, they have a, a shield that came down that they could not see anything except for the instruments. They flew blind. The only thing that they could fly by was the instruments. Landing, takeoff, everything. They never had any visualization of outside their cockpit. That is flying by instruments. Same thing when they land on an aircraft carrier. It's flying by instruments. It's not visualization. Everything outside that cockpit is irrelevant. It's everything in that cockpit. All of these instruments they must rely on. Everything. And that's walking in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has given me new instruments. The first one is knowledge. The second one is your senses. It's an inner witness within you. But so many times people have contaminated that. See, this is an area where we've, what does he say? Cleanse yourself. Why? If you don't cleanse yourself, you'll be dull. Cleanse yourself. Why? Because without cleansing yourself, you're contaminated. That inner witness will not be sensitive to you. In 1 John, in chapter 5, in verse 6, would you read it with me? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who what? Bears witness because the Spirit is what? See, the Spirit bears witness within me and you. These are called senses. It is a witness within me and you. Is everybody okay? But if it's contaminated, we won't have it. It'll be false. It'll be misleading. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. The third instrument is called discernment. Proverbs chapter 2. Would you read it with me? My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands, where? Within you. So that you incline your ear to what? Wisdom. And apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for what? Discernment. And lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. That's reverence, honor, and respect. There will be a fear, that reverence to God. See, you won't be quick to do something without knowing that it's being led by Him. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the what? Knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, Discretion, which is also discernment, will what? Preserve you. Understanding will keep you. To deliver you from the way of evil and from the man who speaks perverse things. From those who leave the path of uprightness and walk 
in the ways of darkness. Discernment, wisdom, and understanding will produce an outer witness in the environment. It is called discernment. So again, your senses is an inner witness. Discernment is an outer. Is everybody okay? In other words, we want to be able to discern times, seasons, events, transitions. What's holy? What's not holy? What's clean? What's not clean? All of these things. What's truth? What's a lie? Discernment is an instrument. Philippians chapter 4. Many people don't know what true peace is. There's a lot of false peace. You can accomplish something and think, oh, that's great. Yeah, I got a good peace. No. That's not. See, there's the peace of the world and there's the peace of God. There's difference. The fourth instrument is peace. In Philippians chapter 4. In verse 4, what does it say? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men that the Lord is where? In hand. Be anxious for everything. Be anxious for nothing. Anxious for nothing. Anxious for nothing. Well, what's the opposite of anxiousness? Peace. See, if you cannot discern if you don't know that peace that true peace you will fall into anxiousness you'll be pushed instead of led and you'll think that you're pushing is leading when it's really not be anxious for nothing but in everything by what prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to god and the peace of God, which surpasses what? All understanding. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It will guard your heart and your mind. There won't be the question, if. What if? It's not there. There is no question. It's a complete peace of of pure trust. There's no anxiousness. There's no area to do. It's an area of wait. And those who wait on the Lord will be what? Mount up like what? Eagles. You know what an eagle's delicacy is? Serpents. Yeah, man. They eat snakes. Yeah. This peace, it's an inner, I want, it's, a, it's an inner sense and where it helps me and you to discern whether we are being pushed or led. But when that peace comes, you get into a place of whatever. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. You didn't need to do it? No, whatever. The enemy will try and push you in every direction. You get into this place where it's Whatever. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, so what? Why? Because God's got it in control. Why? Because I've given him control over it. If I don't give him control over it, see, we can give him control over it right now. Two minutes later, you take back control. And you're looking for that peace. And the only peace you're going to get is when you accomplish what you set out to do. But that's false peace. That's not true peace. So what people do is they get so busy. Dun, 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 dun. I got to do this. Pew, ah, peace. Done. Next one. Pew, pop, pop, pop. Next. Pew, done. Ah. That is not true peace. That's a lie from hell. And it keeps persons in, in a, an entangle like one of those little mouses and the things that go around. And they're always running, running, running. And they get nowhere. That's false peace. There's the peace of God that gets you into a place where you go, whatever. 
the fifth thing, the fifth instrument. All right, so we've talked about the first four. Knowledge, senses, discernment, peace. The fifth instrument is called fruits. It is an instrument. It's a fruit checker. Matthew 7. You know, you go through the airport and you got to go through the scanning thing, you know. They need to go through checking fruit. Matthew 7. That instrument lights up, man. Beep. See, these instruments are like sonar and radar. Nothing, nothing can hide from them. Whether it's underwater or whether it's in the air, it doesn't matter. These instruments are utilized in the spirit. That's why they're called spiritual instruments. Fruits. Matthew 7, is everybody there? Verse 15. It says, beware of what? False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will what? You will know them. You will know their fruits. You, you do not judge someone by their gifts. Well, that person's very talented. Whippy. Talent is not a fruit. It is a gift. Well, man, that person can, does all the gifts of the Spirit. It's still a gift. It is not a fruit. Because it even says, many will come to me and say, Lord, I did all the gifts of the Spirit. Come on, let me in. No. You practice lawlessness. You might have used the gifts of the Spirit, but you no, did not bear good fruit. No entrance. So, that is an instrument. You will know them by their fruit. What comes out of their mouth, how they react, how, or whether they react according to the world, whether they respond according to the Spirit, who they associate with, what their jobs are. You, you will know them by their fruit. Amen? The sixth thing. The sixth instrument. Are you ready for this one? It's called counsel. Now, I want you to look at this in counsel because where are the instruments placed? On the counsel. Very good. Proverbs 11. Spiritual instruments. Oh, oh that's Proverbs chapter 11. Anybody there yet? I think it's in verse 14, somewhere around there. Would you read it with me? Where there is no counsel, the what? The people fall. Hmm. But in the multitude of counselor, there is what? Safety. Well, hallelujah. Let's go to another one. Proverbs 15. In verse 22, I think. Proverbs 15, verse 22, it says what? Without counsel, plans go away, but a multitude of counselors, they are what? Established. So what we're doing is counsel, like an instrument panel, counsel recalibrates the instruments. Is everybody with me? 
It recalibrates the instruments so that they are perfected and sensitive. That's what counsel does. So when we go to counsel, what's happening? We're confirming our instruments of recalibration. So what we are sensing, what we are discerning, we want to make sure it lines up with counsel so that our instruments are recalibrated. If it doesn't, we need some recalibration. We're going to skip that one. We don't need to go there. Counsel. Everybody got it? All right, are you ready for the seventh one? Conviction. That's a phenomenal instrument. Conviction. And John 8. Well, I haven't been convicted by the Lord about nothing. Well, you need to throw that instrument out and get a new one. John chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. He did what? He trained them, didn't he? Amen. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that, should, that, we should be, that she should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that he might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger, Get behind me. As though he didn't hear them. <laughs> In verse 7. So when they continued asking him, they were pressing him. Come on, what is this? We got this woman who's caught in adultery. Let us stone her. He raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now, his presence brought conviction. Does everybody understand that? His presence brought conviction. See, so the more that the devil keeps you away from fellowship in God's presence, the less you will be, con you will be sensitive to the conviction. Because his presence brings conviction. So you can stay as far as away as you want. And, well, nah, that don't bother me. No, that don't bother me. I don't need to do any of that. In fact, that conviction instrument is going boop, 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 and you ain't paying no attention to it. It's got all this kind of dust on it and stuff. He said, he who has not sinned, throw the what? Throw the first stone, man. <laughs> and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being what? Convicted. Why? Because they were what? In his presence. Does everybody understand that? They were convicted by their conscience and one went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of you? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Hello? Didn't say, I, you know, you're cool now. Just go ahead and keep doing it. No. Go and sin no more. Does everybody get it? Conviction is an instrument. It is manifested. It is ge engineers powered by God's presence. Without God's presence, there's no conviction. And the eighth one, which in eight means new beginnings. Second Corinthians chapter 12.
It is an instrument of revelation. Revelation. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 1. Spiritual instruments. Utilizing these keeps us in the spirit. Keeps us in the spirit. Keeping God's presence will keep these instruments activated. They keep them empowered. In verse 1, would you read it with me? It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and what? Revelations, Revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body, I don't know, or whether out of the body, I don't know. God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one, I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Again, revelation is an instrument. It's a word from God now. Revelation is a word from God now. It's an instrument that should always kept clean. Always be ready. We're getting a word from God now. He's imparting revelation by illumination of his word. Amen? So, spiritual instruments, eight of them, knowledge, senses, discernment, peace, fruits, counsel, conviction, and revelation. Utilize them. Keep them clean. Be sensitive to them. And walk in the path of the Spirit that He's guided for me and you. And you'll have victory. You'll have prosperity. Spiritual prosperity. Where there's spiritual prosperity, there's financial prosperity. Amen? Stand fast. Submit all the way. And don't get pushed out of position. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Let this seed that's been parted, this training seed that's been imparted in us, be protected by the blood of Christ. And let it grow and bear fruit for your glory. Bringing these instruments to remembrance by the Holy Spirit who guides us to all truth and teaches us. And let it be manifested in us and through us that we may walk according to your will. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.